The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all king-size cigarettes. Brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a traffic investigation. Hit-run felony detail. An elderly woman and her nine-year-old grandson are struck down in a pedestrian crosswalk by a speeding truck. The woman is killed instantly. Witnesses fail to get the license number. The hit-run driver escapes. Your job? Find him. The latest Fatima sales report shows thousands and thousands of king-size cigarette smokers are switching to Fatima. For the month of October, coast-to-coast actual figures show... Fatima sales are up 110%, or more than double. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you are now smoking. Remember, thousands of Americans are switching to extra mild Fatima. Next time, insist on the best, king-size Fatima, in the distinctive golden yellow package. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, December 21st. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of traffic division, hit and run felony detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Calfee, Commander AID. My name's Friday. It was 10.51 p.m. when we got to the Carlton Theater, the box office. Thank you. How many, please? Police officers, ma'am. I'd like to talk to you for a minute, if we could. Oh, yes, you mean about the accident? Yes, ma'am. One of the officers in the traffic car across the street, he told us you're one of the people who saw it happen. Yes, that's right. Terrible thing. It was an old lady and a grandson, you know. Yes, ma'am. Would it be possible for you to get a relief for a little while? A few questions we'd like to ask you about it. It won't take very long. Well, I'll be off duty at 11. That's when the box office closes. Eight minutes to 11 now. Would you like to wait? All right, ma'am. Fine. Cold wind out there. Would you like to wait in here? Right on back here, I'll open the door for you. All right, ma'am, thank you. Yeah, it's nice and warm. Did anybody get the license number, do you know, officer? I mean, on that truck that ran them down? No, not that we know of. We understand the officers in the traffic car talked to you. You didn't see the number either? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. The whole thing happened so fast. I saw the old lady grab the little boy, pull him next to her. It was an awful thing. The truck hit them both together. It's funny the things you notice. Boy was carrying a little box of candy. I heard this terrible thud when the truck hit them. I looked and the candy was spilled all over the street. I just couldn't help it. I got sick to my stomach. Yes, ma'am, I can understand. Now, about this truck that ran them down, do you think you'd know it if you ever saw it again? Well, I'm not sure. I think I might, yes. It was one of those delivery trucks, you know. I think you'd call it a panel truck. It was a light tan color all over, and there was black lettering on the side. Mm-hmm. Could you make out any of the lettering at all? Well, I think there were three or four words painted on the side, and I know one of them was bakery. I'm sure of that. Did you recognize what make a truck it was, ma'am? The year, the model? It was a late model. I'm pretty sure of that. Either a Chevrolet or a Ford, I'd say. One of those regular delivery trucks like some bakeries use. You sure about that word you saw lettered on the side? It said bakery. Yes, I'm positive of that. Now, anything else out of the ordinary that you might have noticed about the truck, ma'am? Anything outstanding that might have caught your eye? No, I'm sorry, officer. That's about all I can tell you. How is the old lady? Do you know and the little boy? Could they tell you anything? Yes, ma'am. The woman's dead. She was killed instantly. They've taken the youngster over to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Afraid he's in pretty bad shape, too. Terrible shame. Poor old lady. She lives right here in the neighborhood, you know. I've seen her shopping in the market next door here Saturday afternoon. It's just tragic. Yes, ma'am, it is. Boy's her grandson, you know. Somebody said he was down visiting her for the Christmas vacation. Seemed like a nice kid, well-behaved. She seemed so proud of him. Should be a sad Christmas for the family. Mm. Just one more question, ma'am. When the boy and his grandmother were crossing the street, would you say the visibility was good? I mean, is there any reason why it would have been hard for a driver to see them? No reason in the world, officer. It's a clear night. You can see how well the intersections lighted up, all the Christmas lights strung up along here. Mm -hmm. The lights from the theater marquee was just as well lighted then as it is now. Yeah, I see. The intersection was perfectly clear. No other cars around. 
boy had a white sweater on. The old lady was wearing a light-colored coat. Certainly easy to see the traffic light, too. It said stop. I can't understand why that driver didn't see him. No, ma'am, neither can we. How could anybody do such a thing? It just isn't any excuse for it. No excuse in the world. It's downright murder. Well, maybe that explains it. What? That's why I kept going. 11.35 p.m. Ben and I finished interviewing the cashier in the theater box office, and then we called the office and had them get out a supplementary broadcast and an APB on the description of the hit-and-run vehicle. We went back across the street to the scene of the accident where the officers in the T-car, along with the crew from the crime lab, were finishing up their preliminary investigation. We interviewed two more witnesses to the hit-run accident, but they were unable to tell us anything that we didn't already know. When we got back to the office, we put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where they told us the nine-year-old boy struck down by the hit-run driver was still in a critical condition. The husband of the 64-year-old woman, who had been killed instantly, was brought downtown to the morgue where he identified the body. The next morning, we got out a special bulletin to all garages, auto repair, and paint shops throughout the city to be on the lookout for a late model tan panel truck, black lettering on the side, with damage to the front end. 8.30 a.m., I checked with communications, and then I went back to the office. Hi. Just checked with Georgia Street, Joe. I asked him about the boy. The old lady's grandson? How's he doing? About the same. Critical condition. That's about all they'll say. That's a lousy shame. Communications get any kickback on the old points yet? No, nothing at all. You get in touch with the crime lab? Yeah, they're not going to be able to help much. What did they find out there? Anything at all? Just what we saw. A few small pieces of glass, probably from one of the headlights on a truck. They don't think they're going to be able to do much with them. There's not enough for it to go on. That's the only physical evidence they got, huh? That's all. Might be able to tie it down a little tighter if we could find that panel. Yeah. You start checking on that bakery truck angle yet? McGowan and I called every bakery in town. Got it pretty well narrowed down. There's only two companies that use tan late model panels for delivery trucks. Well... Only one of them uses black lettering on the sides of the truck. Other company says they use red lettering. Which one has the black? I uh, got it right here. Uh, outfit called Nielsen's Wholesale Bakery. They got a fleet of $100 black lettering on both sides. Late model Ford delivery truck. Mm -hmm. They tell you whether or not any of their drivers could have been making deliveries that time of night? 10, 30, 11 o'clock? Yeah, there were about a dozen of them out on deliveries. Uh, more of them to account for than that, though. How do you mean? All their drivers are allowed to take the trucks home with them when they're off duty if they want to. Yeah. I'm afraid it's going to mean checking out every one of them, Joe. Well, we might as well get moving on it. They're going to give us some kind of a list to work with, are they? Yeah, I've got it all set up with them. Uh -huh. I'll get it. Uh -huh. Accident investigation, Romero. Oh, yes, sir. That's all. Mm -hmm, I see. You're right, thank you. Rotten deal. Yeah, what's the matter? That young kid, the grandson? Yeah. He just died. <laughs> Many times and on many different occasions, the police officer has it proved to him that there can be very little difference between a crime of neglect and a crime that's been willfully premeditated. If you look at it closely enough, you can judge it for yourself. How much difference, for example, as far as moral guilt is concerned, is there between the following? Number one, a man who plans a killing, takes up a gun, finds his victim, and shoots him to death. Or number two, the man who thinks he has to look out for no one's welfare but his own, gets behind the wheel of a car, disregards the ordinary rules of safety, and proceeds to commit homicide with a motor vehicle. Oftentimes, the crime masquerades under the guise of an accident. Morally, no matter how you spell it, it adds up to murder just as surely as if the person had taken a gun and shot the victim down. The way it looked to us, the hit-and-run killing of the elderly woman and her grandson was a prime example. Wednesday, December 22nd, Ben and I began checking out the delivery trucks owned by Nielsen's Wholesale Bakery. Late that afternoon, we located one of the trucks with recent damage to the front end. We checked and found the driver's name was Arthur V. Singer. We drove out to his home to interview him. No, I wasn't working last night, officer. I was off. What's it all about? Did you spend the night at home, Mr. Singer, or were you out? I was home part of the time. After dinner, I went downtown to a little bowling. Our neighborhood team bowls every Tuesday night. Where is that, sir? Place downtown. It's on West 7th. Got a pretty good team. Mm-hmm. Did you drive down, Mr. Singer, or did you take the bus? No, I drove down. Had the company truck with me. Let us use them when we're off duty. We pay for the gas. Did you drive down by yourself, or was there someone else with you? No, I was alone. The other boys had their cars. When did you leave the bowling alley, you remember? Mm, about 10, 10, 15, I'd say. How'd you drive home, Mr. Singer? I mean, what route did you take? Oh, I drove straight out west 7th. Got the Coronado. Came over Coronado to the house here. Why do you want to know? What time did you get home? About quarter to 11. Yeah, this wouldn't be about that little scrape I had last night, would it? What was that? Down at 7th and Grandview, right by Westlake Park there. 
Old guy in the car ahead, he stopped fast right in front of me. Didn't even signal. All right. Yeah, I almost plowed right into him. Lucky I was watching. I slammed on the brakes, turned in toward the curb. Should have seen it. I clipped the headlight and the right fender against the telephone pole. Had to take the truck in this morning, get it fixed up. Are there any witnesses to this accident that you had, Singer? Yeah, a half dozen people saw it. Did you get any names and addresses? Well, no, I didn't. I was so teed off about the whole thing, I guess I didn't think about it. Is there anyone at all we can check with? Anybody to corroborate your story? Just the old guy in that car. Sure, a lousy driver. I really chewed him out. Did you get his name and address? No, but I took down his license number. Wasn't going to pay for that damage. He admitted it was his fault. I see. Do you mind giving us that license number? No, if I can find it. Wrote it down on the back of an old envelope. Thought I'd put it in my jacket when I looked this morning. It wasn't there. It's around someplace, so I'll check around again before I leave for work. It'll be bound to turn up. I'd like to have you look for it now, Mr. Singer. If you would, it's pretty important. Well, I think I get it, officer. What's this all about, anyway? Preliminary investigation. Want to see if you can find that number for it? Why? What did it have to do with an investigation? I didn't do anything. That old man was his fault. Well, a bakery truck was involved in a serious accident last night, the same kind that you were driving. Afraid you're going to need some kind of an alibi, Mr. Singer. Alibi? I don't know what you mean. Why do I have to have an alibi? Well, just take my word for it. You're going to need one. Well, why do I need one? Two reasons. Yeah? A nine-year-old boy and his grandmother. We continued questioning the suspect, Arthur Singer, but he denied any knowledge of the hit-run accident the night before at the intersection of Drexel and Pico Boulevard. We stayed with him while he searched his home for the license number of the car, which he said caused him to have his accident the night before. After half an hour of looking, he came up with a number scribbled on a scrap of paper which he'd found back in one corner on the floor of his closet. We put in a call to RDMV, and they came back with the information that the license number was registered to a Mr. Thomas Foley on Lancashire Boulevard. We drove out to the address to check with Mr. Foley, but there was nobody home. We left our card along with a message to contact us as soon as possible. 4.15 p.m., Ben and I got back to the office. At 4.35, Mr. Foley returned our call. Yes, sir, that's right. Oh, you did, uh-huh. I see. Well, what time was that? Do you remember? Oh. Well, all right, Mr. Foley. Thank you very much. We may be contacting you later. All right, bye. What'd you get? Thought this was starting out too easy. Why? What'd he say? Apparently, this Arthur Singer's telling us the truth. Mr. Foley says he did have a little scrape with a bakery truck last night. Described Singer as the driver of the truck. Well, what about the location? Is Foley pretty sure about that? Grandview and West 7. Says it happened about 10.35 last night. That puts Singer about three miles from the scene of the hit run. It's impossible, Joe. Yeah. This Mr. Foley's right. Singer couldn't have done it. Wasn't anywhere near the scene. I sure thought he was there, didn't you? We can drive out and double check with Foley. Can't think of any reason why he'd lie about it, can you? I just saw it. Accident investigation, Friday. Yeah, it's had. Where? Yeah. Nobody, huh? Yeah, right away, thanks. Well, it's moving a little fast. Got a piece of luck here. Who was it? Ted Zimmerman. He and McClendon are down south end of town. Yeah? The hit-and-run truck. They think maybe they found it. 4.28 p.m. Ben and I left the office and drove to the south end of the city where we met with Sergeant Zimmerman and McClendon, a block from where the tan panel bakery truck had been located. As soon as the truck had been discovered, an immediate stakeout was placed on it. A code 5 was broadcast on the vehicle's location, warning all units to stay away so as not to discourage the suspect in case he decided it was safe to return and get the truck. Ben and I drove down the side street where the truck was parked and got a good look at the front end of it. The right headlight was damaged and so was the right fender. While Zimmerman and McClendon remained on stakeout, Ben and I contacted the Nielsen Bakery people again, gave them the number of the truck, and they traced down the driver's name for us. He was listed as Daniel Miller. He'd been employed by the bakery for the past three years, and he had a good record. They told us this was his day off. 5.30 p.m., we checked at his home address, but his wife told us he wasn't there. She said that besides driving a truck for the bakery, he also had a part-time job at night. He worked as a counterman at a small coffee shop out on Wilshire Boulevard. We drove out to the coffee shop and interviewed him on the job. No, I'm sorry. I don't know where the truck is. I wish I did. Well, what happened, Mr. Miller? Was it stolen? No, no, not exactly. A fellow that comes in here quite a bit, his name's Paul. Good customer. He borrowed the truck from me last night. Said he'd only be gone an hour. I haven't seen him since. Where does this man live, this friend of yours, Paul? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Good customer. He comes in quite a bit at night when I'm working. Gotten to know him pretty well. He asked to borrow the truck for an hour. Didn't think much about it. Let him have it. Is there anything wrong? What's this Paul's last name, you know? No, I guess I don't. Never thought to ask him, as a matter of fact. Guess they never had any reason to. About what time was it last night that you loaned him the truck? A little after 8 o'clock, I think it was. He said he wanted to take his television set over to a guy he knew and get it fixed. He told me he'd 
Be back by 10 o'clock at the latest. You don't know where this man lives? You have no idea at all how to get in touch with him? No, I guess I don't, Sergeant. Why? You in the habit of lending the truck to strangers? No, not usually. Well, what's your beef, anyway? What's this all about? What are your hours here at the coffee shop, Miller? When do you check in for work and when do you leave? I check in at 7 o'clock. I go a straight five hours to midnight. That's when we close up, midnight. Well, you worked that shift last night, did you? 7 p.m. straight through to midnight? That's right. Monday through Saturday, six days a week. That's the schedule. Just a part-time job for me, extra dough, you know. My regular job is driving the truck for the bakery. Was anyone around last night when your friend Paul came in to borrow the truck? Maybe another customer, a waitress, somebody we could double-check with? You no, know, there were a couple of other customers in the place. Don't know who they were, though. Why do you have to double-check, anyway? I haven't done anything. I loaned Paul a truck, that's all. Well, have you any way at all of proving you were here from 7 to 12 last night? Must have been some customers you waited on that you remember. Sure, there are at least half dozen of them. They'll tell you I was here. I'd like to have their names and addresses if you don't mind, Miller. Yeah. Excuse me a minute, huh? Got a customer to wait sure, on. Sure, right in. Hi, right, Dan, I missed you last night. Hi, right, Fred, what do you have? Coffee, a couple of those donuts back there, pot of sugar ones. Okay. Yeah, me and the missus dropped in for a sandwich after the show last night. We're looking for you. That so? Yeah, about 10.30. Where were you, Dan? You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. If you smoke king-size cigarettes, listen to Fatima's amazing new offer. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy their extra mildness and superbly blended tobaccos. If you don't like Fatimas better than the king-size cigarette you are now smoking, return the pack with the unused Fatimas before December 1st and we'll give you your money back, plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. We make this amazing offer because we believe Fatima is the best of all king-size cigarettes. Smokers all over the country are confirming this every day. Fatima's latest sales report shows Fatima sales up in every state in America. For the month of October, coast-to-coast actual figures show Fatima sales up 110%, or more than double. Yes, thousands of Americans are switching to Fatima. So why wait? Switch to Fatima today. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. p.m., Wednesday, December 22nd. We continued questioning the hit-run suspect, Daniel Miller, for a full hour. But he seemed to be unable to account for his time the previous night. His first story was that he'd been on duty behind the counter in the coffee shop without a break between the hours of 7 p.m. and midnight. Then, after the customer entered and disclosed that he was in the coffee shop at 10.30 the night before and that Miller was nowhere about, the suspect switched his story. He said he thought he left the coffee shop briefly for about 15 minutes between 10.30 and 10.45 p.m. to run down the street to a hotel to say goodbye to some friends of his who were leaving for New York. We checked at the hotel, but they didn't know Miller, and they hadn't seen him the night before. They were sure of it. We returned to the coffee shop and took up the questioning of the suspect all over again, but he made little or no sense at all. Apparently, he was piling up lie after lie in an effort to cover his tracks before and after the hit-and-run murder the night before. 7.48 7.48 p.m., Ben and I pulled Miller off the job at the coffee shop and took him downtown to the interrogation room. I'm telling you, it's the truth. I wasn't in that truck last night. I wasn't in an accident. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then give us something to go on, Miller. You've handed three different stories so far. Not one of them strong enough to hold water. I'm telling you the truth. What are you trying to hang this on me for? I didn't have a wreck and I didn't kill anybody. Why are you picking on me? Because you don't make sense, mister. You're trying to sell us a story and you haven't got one ounce of proof to back it up. That bakery truck you're responsible for is the same truck that killed the old woman and the little boy. Now, you come up with a solid story that we can check on, or you're going to be resting your back in the main jail. No wonder they call you cops dumb. I wasn't in that truck last night. Can't you get that through your heads? I wasn't in the truck. I didn't have an accident. Then prove it to us, Mr. Miller. That's all we're waiting for. Uh, Listen, call Bill Calder. He's a good customer. He was in last night, I think. He'll tell you. Go ahead and call him. He'll back up what I say. What's his number, do you know? Yeah, I I got it. You're right Right here in my wallet. Yeah, the bill can tell you. Yeah, here it is. Uh-huh, thank you. Hello, William Calder there, please. Yes, ma'am, it's important. 
All right, will you have him call Michigan 5211? Yeah, 5211. That's extension 2512. Right, thank you very much. Well, he's busy. He'll call back in a minute. He'll tell you the truth. I was in the coffee shop all night. Just those couple of minutes, I ran down to the hotel to say goodbye to those friends of mine. That's the only time I left the place. Well, how come you couldn't tell us that to begin with, Miller? You say you've got nothing to hide? Well, why do you have to handle three different stories? Which one are we supposed to believe? I got nervous, that's all, when you first come in and started to ask questions. I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't know there was any trouble. I just loaned the truck to this guy, Paul, as a favor. How would I know what he was going to do? Getting himself in a jam like that. All right, now try to look at it from where we stand, Miller. You loan out your truck to a man. You don't know his last name. You don't know where he lives. You say he must have been driving the truck when the lady and the boy were killed. Sure, he must have been driving it. I wasn't. I was back at the coffee shop. I was there until midnight. All right, then prove it to us. If you know the man well enough to loan him the truck, you ought to be able to find him. Now, they, uh, must be Bill Calder. He'll tell you. Go ahead. See what he says. Yeah. Interrogation room, Friday. Oh, yeah, Mr. Calder. Well, my name's Sergeant Friday, LAPD, Accident Investigation. Friday, yes, sir, that's right. Wonder if you'd tell me if you know a Daniel Miller... Mm-hmm. When's the last time you saw him? Do you remember? I see. The place where he works, the coffee shop? Were you in there last night by any chance? Did you see Miller in there? You're sure? Yes, sir. No, sir, that's all for now. Thank you very much. We're going to contact you later on. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, how about it? He told you, didn't he? That enough for you? He says he hasn't been in the coffee shop for three days. 9.45 p.m. Our interrogation of the hit-and-run suspect, Daniel Miller, went on. At his suggestion, we called half a dozen people who he figured might substantiate his alibi, but none of them were able to. Miller continued to deny any knowledge of the hit-and-run killing, but he still couldn't account for his whereabouts at the exact hour the nine-year-old boy and his grandmother were run down. The time element especially didn't work in his favor. Nothing worked in his favor. 11.30 p.m., Ben and I took Daniel Miller over to the main jail where he was booked in on suspicion of 480 V.C. The following afternoon, his lawyer obtained a writ and he was released from custody. The writ was returnable in five days. He came immediately to the office to plead with Ben and I to help him find Paul, the man who'd borrowed his truck and thus clear himself. We took him up on it. Either way, we figured we'd get to the bottom of it. If Miller dreamed up the character Paul to escape blame for the hit-and-run killing, we were bound to find out sooner or later. If Miller was telling the truth, we had little reason to believe he was, and a man named Paul had borrowed the truck the night of the hit-and-run killing, we were bound to find that out, too. In any event, we had to investigate. It's the job of the police officer to prove guilt or innocence, not guilt alone. Two days passed, and then another two. The Monday following the Christmas weekend, we were ready to call a halt. I don't know what else we can do. I think we've given enough time, don't you? Well, the deeper we get into it, the more it looks like Miller's our man. I still can't make up my mind. Why do you have to be stubborn about it? We've checked every possible angle on his story. We still haven't an ounce of proof that this guy Paul he talks about even exists. We can't string along with Miller forever. Yeah, I suppose you're right. We've given him a square enough break on it. I still got that funny hunch. It's possible he might be telling the truth. We've gone four straight days on it, Joe. Haven't come across one lead to back up his story. Too much for me. I can't buy it anymore. Go ahead. Sergeant? Oh, how are you, Miller? I'm okay. Glad to see you. I've been looking for you. We've been looking for your friend, Miller. Still haven't found a trace of him. That's why I came down to see you. A friend of mine called me this morning. He knows this guy, Paul, I told you about. He says he saw him last night, going into a hotel down on South Flower. How come we haven't heard from this friend of yours before? We've checked through twice on the list of everybody you know. This fellow's been out of town, just got back yesterday. When he heard about the jam I was in, he called me about seeing Paul. Mm Mm-hmm. This hotel Paul was supposed to have been seen going into. Have you got the address of that? Yeah, it's over on South Flower, right near 12th. You want to go over there with me right now? This friend of mine wouldn't kid me. Paul must be there. You're sure about that? He must be there. I'll bet a month's pay on it. You might be low, mister. What? Stands to cost you a lot more than that. We went up to the third floor, room 318, but the man registered as Paul Barton wasn't in. He'd left no word at the desk as to when he'd return. We sent Miller home and told him to wait for our call. Ben and I went on stakeout at the hotel. At 7.25 that night, Paul Barton returned to his room and we began questioning him. He showed no signs of being upset. His answers were quick, straightforward, and they seemed to make sense. The interview went on. A half hour, an hour, 
and Barton began to grow a little nervous. He contradicted himself. Big holes began to show up in his story as to how and where he'd spent his time the night of the hit-run killing. 8.45 p.m., Ben and I took Barton back to the office. We found Zimmerman in the squad room and had him phone Miller at his home and ask him to come downtown as soon as possible. Meantime, we checked Paul Barton through R&I, and then we took him to the interrogation room where the questioning went on. You're a little mixed up about that, aren't you, Mr. Borden? I thought you said you went to that bar downtown about 10 p.m. and then you went to visit at your sister's house. Now you tell us you went to your sister's house first and then you went to the bar downtown. Now, which is it? Well, that's getting a little high-handed, isn't it? Why do I have to account for my time to you? If it wasn't important, we wouldn't be asking you. I think you know that. Well, I don't know anything of the kind. You're trying to take advantage of me. That's the only impression I can get. I think I've answered enough of your questions. I'm going back to the hotel. Just a minute, Borden. There's one more thing. Yeah? Last time you were arrested for a traffic violation, you want to tell us what the charge was? What? I think you heard me. Well, that was a year ago. I was driving a little too fast going out Beverly Boulevard, and what's that got to do with it? Our record bureau says the charge was for drunk driving. Your license was revoked, isn't that right? Well, so what? I haven't been driving. I haven't been near a car. What about last Tuesday night? Huh? Last Tuesday night. Did you do any driving then? No, no, of course not. You're sure about that? If you're not trapping me, I answer all your questions. I'm getting out of here. No, you're going to stay right where you are, mister. Stay put. Ben, you want to check next door, see if Miller's come in. Yeah, okay. You can't make me stay here. It's illegal. You got nothing to hold me on. All right, then there's nothing to worry about. This won't take very long. We got a man by the name of Miller coming in. He says he thinks he knows you. Miller? I don't know any Miller. Nice going, Paul. Where you been? I said, where you been? What'd you do with the truck? I'm looking for him. Grab him, Ben. Grab him. Grab him. All right, now, let me go. Settle down, settle down. Come on, mister, settle down. I didn't do I, I didn't do a thing. I well, look, you can't prove it. You, you can't prove it, I did. They're going to prove it, Paul. I'm going to help them prove it. You should have been a real good friend. But give me a break, Danny. I, I didn't mean it. Honest, I didn't mean it. I loan you the truck. You get boozed up. You run down the little kid and the grandmother. Then you take off and leave me holding the sack like I did it. But I didn't mean it, Danny. It was an accident. I wasn't boozed up. Yeah, you're a real good friend. I hope you get it in the neck. I hope you get it with both barrels. Look, Sergeant, that's not true. I wasn't boozed up. I only had two drinks. Now, believe me, that's all I had. Yeah. I couldn't have been drunk. It doesn't affect me that way. Two drinks never hurt me. A couple of drinks never hurt anybody. They killed a little boy and his grandmother. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, we made Fatima's money-back radio offer for the first time on Dragnet over a month and a half ago, Thursday, September 20th. Here's what happened. Over 10 million listeners heard Fatima's famous offer. That's right. Millions heard it, yet only 44 have written. Now, if you haven't smoked Fatima's yet... Remember what we said back in September still goes. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy their extra mildness and superbly blended tobaccos. If you don't like Fatimas better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, return the pack with the unused Fatimas and we'll give you your money back, plus postage. Thousands of Americans are switching to Fatima, so why wait? Switch to Fatima today. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. <laughs> Paul Barton was filed on for violation of the State Vehicle Code, Section 480, a hit-and-run felony, and also for manslaughter, two counts. He was convicted only for Section 480 and received sentence as prescribed by law. A hit-and-run felony is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than five years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy next on NBC. NBC.